Hello, Dr. Leo Hadfield. It is an amazing privilege to be sharing the Word of God with you again today as we are in the middle of our series that we entitled Come and See. Now, in this series, we are looking at the gospel recounts, the good news through the lens of the gospel of John. Now, John is the disciple, the son of Zebedee, and he is the last person to write a gospel account. So Mark and Luke and Matthew write first, and then at the end of his life, John comes and he writes his account of the gospel. When he writes, he now writes to probably a second generation of Gentile and Jew alike after Jesus was on earth. And he writes with a very specific focus. This focus we find in John 20, verse 31. When John says, this is the reason why at the end of my life I now write to you a gospel account. It is for this purpose. But these are written so that you may believe. What? That Jesus is not just a mere man. That Jesus is is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Now, in this statement, the reason why John writes this gospel account, he's trying to answer this question, is Jesus just a good spiritual person or is there more to him? Now, you and I know that uh, many people have asked this question. Christians have asked this question. Non-Christians have asked this question. Because we know that historically, Jesus did walk this planet. There is more evidence historically of the existence of Jesus Christ than there is of Julius Caesar. So we know that Jesus walked the earth. The question, though, that John wants us to consider is, was Jesus just a good person, a good spiritual person maybe, or was there more to him? Now, there's, there's many things in my life where I've asked this question, if we just put Christianity aside for the moment, but just this concept of asking whether there's more to what meets the eye, more to an activity or more to a skill or more to a person. Now, the one thing that I thought was quite easy, but I, I realized with, uh, with very difficult experience was actually quite difficult, is to do a photo shoot. Now, I've had to do many of these and then even in the recent past, as recent as this past weekend, I had to do a photo shoot. This was a bit easier because the focus wasn't on me for some other business website. The focus was on my family where our oldest son, Andreas, is graduating. And we had an opportunity to do a photo shoot with our family to honor this achievement. Now, let me make this statement. I thought photo shoots were easy. I realized that there's more than meets the eye. I abhor them. I hate them. And I don't often use that word. I would much rather sit in a, an aggressive, hostile board meeting in a listed company and defend a position. I would much rather do public speaking. I would much rather raise children in this world than do a photo shoot. Why? Because I know that I struggle to smile when people tell me to smile and to turn a shoulder and to pout and to do all these strange things. And I know that I'm terrible when, as happened this past weekend, the photographer tells you, you are doing so well. You are fantastic. You are a natural. And I'm thinking you are a liar because this is harder than it looks. I thought that it was easy, but this is just so hard. So you and I know what it feels like to look at something, to look at someone and say, is there more than meets the eye? Now, 
in this question, is there more than meets the eye in Jesus, the Son of God, or just a man? We know that Christians and non-Christians ask this question alike. We know that Christians ask this question when, when difficult things happen in our lives, when we are caught unawares, when we are caught off guard, and we start wondering, this good news that we hear about this Jesus, is He really good? Because I believe in Him, I believe that He is the resurrected Son of God, but if He is, then how on earth could this thing happen to me? Is He not my Savior? Is He not there in any circumstance working towards my good? It's usually in these circumstances where we consciously or unconsciously start asking these questions. Was Jesus not maybe just a good spiritual man? Was He really the Son of God? Non-Christians also ask these questions, and this question particularly. And they ask this question because they have never experienced the life-changing, life-giving fire that comes into a person's life when they switch on to the reality of Jesus and who He is. A life-changing into an eternity, future-changing experience. But we're going to ask this question today. And I think it's important to ask this question and answer this question. And I think the first thing that we need to learn from John is, is something quite profound in his gospel, other than the reason why he's writing. And I mean that the mere reason of writing is to prove that there's more to Jesus. We've seen that in the previous scripture. But there's something different in this gospel account, this last gospel account that is written. And it's this. John is the only gospel writer that does not narrate the birth of Jesus. And I was quite perplexed. I thought, wow, okay, so this, this, this guy, I mean, he's, he's walked three years with Jesus. He professed and pronounced his name through the known world at that point in time. He walked with the power of the Holy Spirit in him. There must be something here that this John wants to convey to us. And I think it is this, that John wants to give us the gospel in its full context. And when we say context, context means the following. It's the circumstances that form the setting of an event, statement, or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood. You see, John is on about proving that Jesus is more than just a spiritual man. So he wants to give us the full context of the gospel. So what he does as he starts his gospel account, he doesn't start with the birth of Jesus Christ. He starts with the following words. John 1, verse 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. According to John, to get a full context of the good news, the starting point was not the birth of Jesus Christ. The starting point was eternity past. And already something has to shift in our understanding, shift in our mind in the way that John helps us answer this question. And when he then comes in John 3.16 and he gives us his articulation of the good news, he says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his 
one son and the only son that he had, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. So John gives us the full context of the gospel in order to answer the question that we are asking today. And here's the full context. John is essentially saying, when you put John 1 and John 3.16 together, he's saying the following. From eternity past, Jesus loved you. He loved you so much that in the present past, the most recent past, He gave His Son, His only Son, to die for your sins so that you can be reconciled to His love. And then he says, if you in the present choose him as your savior and recognize that he was not just a spiritual man, but that he was the son of God, that you will be able to live a life in his name that will reverberate into an eternal future. And while you are on this side of eternity, you will live a life of light and the darkness will never overcome it. That is the full context of the good news. And then we ask the question, okay, so why is it necessary to understand the full context? I think it's necessary to understand the full context because... If we don't, when things in our lives go pear-shaped, go belly up, goes into the dustbin, in those circumstances, if we take the gospel and a half-truth of the gospel and we apply it into our present situations only, we come up with an answer saying, well, if God is good... How is it possible that this, that, and the other could happen? How is it possible that my sister at a very young age starts rebelling in our house and that my parents that have only a finite capacity and focus and ability has got no bandwidth to give to me or any other of our five siblings in order to help us navigate our lives, in a time in my life at least, where I needed them most. Where is God when, when my mother, just before she retires, after years of working and toiling and trying to do a good thing by her family, when just before she is going to retire and have the capacity and time to dedicate to us and to our children. How is it possible that God then takes her away from us months before she retires from a tooth abscess? How is it possible that my father gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's? before I have the opportunity to get closure on a lot of things that happened in my childhood. And I don't have the opportunity to mend my relationship with this man. How is it possible that my first wife, one who I dated for three years, one with whom I had a pure relationship before we went into marriage, within three years of our marriage, starts having affairs. After 10 years of a relationship, me having to answer the question, what of the past 10 years of my life was true? You see, it's in these circumstances, if we do not understand the full context of the gospel, that when we are confronted with a question, was Jesus really, really the Son of God? Comes and pitches a tent in our hearts. I want to turn us now to John 3. Now in John 3, John introduces us to this guy. His name is Nicodemus. 
Now, Nicodemus asks this question of Jesus. Are you just a good guy or are you the son of God? Is there more to you than meets the eye? And in this account of John 3 verse 1 to 21, I want for us to, through the lens of John, ask this question, not only in its full context, but very personally. And that's why I think it's so, so powerful that John gives us this account of Nicodemus, of a person grappling with this question. We start off in John 3, 1 to 13. Let's start with verse 1. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him, came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs as you do unless God were with him. So here Nicodemus comes and he says the following. He says, are you just a good spiritual person? Or is there more to you? This, this religious, influential, educated man is also a searching man, asking for questions. He, he has seen something in Jesus with all the miracles that he has done. And he knows that there must be something more, but he cannot articulate it. He doesn't really understand it. And that's why in the middle of the night, he comes to Jesus and he says, help me. And today I'm hearing a lot of Christians and non-Christians alike asking this question, maybe unconsciously. And here today the answer is for you. When you ask Jesus, help me to understand who you are really. Because Jesus in verse 3 then says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now looking at this verse 3 and looking at the question, Jesus are you, are you more than just a spiritual person? And Jesus comes with this answer. It sounds like this answer in our context doesn't really answer the question. But in the context of Nicodemus, a Jew, a religious leader, an influential person, an educated person, this answer hits the mark 100%. Because... Remember at this point in time, the Jews believed that because they are born a Jew, because they are descendants of Abraham, they can enter the kingdom of God. No questions asked. They went so far as to say they believed that Abraham was standing at the gates of Hades, at the gates of hell, to make sure that there's no Jew that accidentally goes that path. So they believed that there was nothing else required. They were Jews. They were going to go into the kingdom of God. And here Jesus comes and he says, no, 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 no. You believe that, but that is a half truth. That is not the full context. What I'm telling you is you will have to be born again. Jesus comes and he hits the preconceived idea, the preconceptions, the assumptions of Nicodemus right in the face. Jesus, in answering this question, who he is, goes to the core of what this man Nicodemus believes. Nicodemus believed a half-truth. God says there is more than this truth. Nicodemus is absolutely flabbergasted. He says the following in verse 4, how can anyone be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? You said Nicodemus, being a teacher, being a Pharisee, he knew that out of the Old Testament, the promises of the new covenant were threefold. And they believe it, believed that two of these promises had already been fulfilled. So the first promise was the new covenant will come to fruition when one... Israel had been gathered again. And at this point in time in history, they believed that Israel was gathered. Why? Because they came out of Babylon, out of exile, and that was part of the regathering of Israel. 
The next promise in the covenant was a cleansing and a spiritual transformation of the Jewish nation. And the Pharisees believed themselves to be the custodians of this cleansing and spiritual transformation. So they believed that they, they, they were busy um, bringing this next promise to fulfillment. And they believed that the only outstanding promise was the Messiah to come and rule and be sovereign over the Jewish nation and the entire world. So he believed that all of these promises had already been fulfilled and they were awaiting only the Messiah. And now Jesus comes and he upsets the entire apple cart. And as I was reading through the scripture, I, I wondered for a moment where in my life, in the, in the history of the world, the entire human race apple cart was upset all at once. And I can show to the COVID-19 pandemic, where all at once, whether you a Christian or you a non-Christian, what you believed of this world was upset fundamentally. I believe that humanity came to a point as a result of this crisis that hit all of us at the same time. That Christians came to a point where they came to a crisis of faith. If God is with me, how can these things happen to me? If God loves me, how can this happen to my loved ones? Christians came to a crisis of faith. Secularists, people that follow a secular culture, they came to a crisis of culture. Because in secularism, you believe that I do what I want and I become who I want to be. And now in COVID-19 and lockdowns, I cannot only not become who I want to be. I can't even go where I want to go. My basic freedom of movement has been restricted. This verse where preconceived ideas are being just flattened. I think it's just so relevant to us because in COVID-19, in our crisis of culture, in our crisis of faith, this is where humanity is asking this question in 2022. Was Jesus just a spiritual man or was he really the Son of God? Nicodemus just goes and he says in verse 9, how can these things be. And maybe you sitting here today and you say, how can it be? After everything that I've experienced in these past two years, how can it be that Jesus is the Son of Man? In verse 10, Jesus says the following to Nicodemus, and maybe he's saying that to you today. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? You were birthed physically to understand physical things. If you don't understand physical things even, if you don't understand COVID-19 and all the things that have happened, how can you understand being spiritual beings, being a being that lives into an internal future? How can you understand spiritual things if you have not been born of the Spirit? Verse 19, No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of God. You see, here Jesus is calling Nicodemus. Here Jesus is calling you and I to a higher level of thinking. And he's saying, if there is just a grain of truth that what you believed was the half truth, and I want to give you the good news in its full context, will you be mature enough to embrace it? Or will you run for the hills hoping that you can unhear what I've just shared with you. And then verse 16 comes where he gives Nicodemus the full context of the gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, 
so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. He says, Nicodemus, from eternity past, I loved you. In the recent past, I sent my son. I am the one. If you will choose me, your life will reverberate as you do my will into an eternal future. This is the full context of the gospel. I want to share with you a moment in my life where the full context of the gospel saved my life. A moment in my life where a half-truth wouldn't do it. A moment in my life where a half-truth would have meant my spiritual death. A moment in my life where an understanding of the full context of the gospel took me on a path that saved my life. Now, I've shared with you before that moment where I was in a horse riding accident. Now, in this accident, I, I've never shown you the, the horse that I was on, so hopefully we'll be able to, to show you a picture in the sermon of the horse. Quite a tall thing. And the people were trying to help me on with my one leg onto this horse because uh, I'm a bit older and I can't reach that high, so they had to sort of pick me up to get to the, to the height of the horse. As I grabbed the saddle, trying to get onto the saddle, the horse got a fright for some other reason, and the horse started bolting. I was on the side of the horse, and I realized that the speed at which he is accelerating is going to hurt me badly. So what I did is, mid-flight, I just let go of the saddle. And when I woke up, I was hugging a concrete pot plant about yay high and yay thick. So hopefully in the sermon, we'd be able to show you a picture of the pot plant. And what you'll see in the picture in the pot plant is an indentation about this big that my shoulder made into that pot plant. Pictures of my face showed that uh, there was grazing of, the, um, of the, the texture of the pot plant on my face which meant that millimeters literally saved my life. If I had collided it with my head first, which was about two millimeters, I would have died on the spot. I hit it with my shoulder, and a long story short, I've told this before, I went into an MRI scan. I'm lying in this MRI scan, and I'm in the present now, and I'm saying, God, how can you allow this to happen. I serve you. I love you. You've placed a passion in my heart to be in nature and to ride horses. This was something that I prepared for, something that you um, allowed me to do, that you created the opportunity to do. Lord, how could you allow for this to happen? And while I'm lying there and while, while I'm asking these questions of God, the doctor, as I was going into the MRI scan, his words just kept on recycling my mind. There's a 50% chance that you will never walk again. There's a 50% chance that you will never walk again. Why? Because they saw that my C1 vertebra had fractured. Now, if your C1 breaks and your spinal cord rips at that end, you are paralyzed from the neck down. And I'm lying there and I'm saying, God, how is this possible? I took the gospel, the good news of the gospel, and I applied it into my present circumstances only. It was only when I came out of the MRI scan and the doctor said to me, listen, guy, you, you got very lucky. Did you know that your C1 and your C2 vertebra were naturally fused. So you were born with a factory default that protected your life today. And as the doctor said it, the full context of the gospel made sense to me. Because I realized that from eternity past, God loved me. From eternity past, God dreamt about me, me, my life. 
When I was formed in my mother's womb, that's not the point of where his love started. His love started long before that. That love culminated in him forming me in a specific, particular way for the purpose that he had given me here on earth. The proof of that is to the finest detail of what my body would need to, to protect itself against something that would happen 40 years into my life. He loved me in such detail. And I experienced that evening at home that the full context of the gospel is just so much better than a half-truth. I experienced God saying, do you know that I've loved you forever? Do you know that I will love you forever? Now, walk with me. Talk with me, and together your life will reverberate into an eternal future. That day, a half-truth would have killed me. The full context of the gospel saved my life. So my question to you today is, what will you do with the full context of the gospel in your life today. You see, you can't unhear what John writes in Nicodemus, to, um, in John 3 about Nicodemus. You can't unhear how God changed my life forever. There's something that you will have to do with this knowledge. Jesus says it this way, to Nicodemus in John 3, 19 to 21. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. What will you do with Jesus today? Now, there can only be one of two categories of people that are listening to me right now. The one category is the category that hears the full context of the gospel and rejects it. The other might be those that hear the full context of the gospel and accept it. But there are that subcategory of peoples that accept only a part of it. And it's to those two categories, the rejectors and the part believers, that I want to speak today. Because if you heard this, the full context of the gospel, how God feels about you like forever, if you reject it, it means that you probably, if you're living in South Africa and listening to this, you're probably going to follow a route of secularism. And as you follow that route of secularism where you say, I, I deny any religious intervention in my life and decision making, what I will do is I will make decisions only based on facts, on reason, on science, and what feels good to me. Now I can promise you, if it hasn't happened already, I can promise you it will happen in your life. That bad things will happen that your science, your logic, your reason, and your feel good will not help you protect you from it. You will get to that point where secularism as a philosophy, as a culture that does not have a philosophy on how to deal with suffering, with bad things happening, you will be left in the darkest days of your life. It will be true for you that it's always darkest before it goes pitch black. You will get to that point in your life. And at that point in life, you will remember this day where Jesus said, what will you do with me? 
to those that accept the gospel, that will find their way into an eternal future with God, but those who accept only a half version of the gospel, that see the full context of the good news, but convert it into a version of the gospel that they want to hear. For you, unfortunately, the day will come where something bad happens, and then you say, okay, but God will come through, God will come through, God will come through, and you will continue to pray it. As you wake up, you will pray it. As you sleep, you will pray it. God will come through. So you would pray, for example, Lord, this, this inability to have a child, I will fall pregnant. Lord, this business that is floundering, you will send me a big client. Lord, this child that is just so rebellious, you will have them see the light. Lord, this, this spouse that is that's going out on affairs, you will send this spouse back to me. Lord, this person that lies behind my back in the business, you will shine the light on it eventually. And then, you don't fall pregnant. Your business is liquidated. Your child hurts themselves in inconceivable ways. You get divorced. You get fired and the lying person get promoted. That day, the only thing that will save you will be the full context of the gospel. The full context of the gospel. The gospel that says, eternity past I thought of you. There is nothing in your life that does not pass through the filter of my sovereign grace. My son died for you in the, in the recent past. My son died for every difficulty, every trial, every hurt, every pain. For everything my son died. And because I, he died for it, and in this broken world you, world, you will experience these things. I will work them in my sovereign plan towards your good. Your good from now into an eternity in the future. Trust me. Walk with me. It's the only way to make sense of this world. What will you do with this question today? Who is this Jesus? Is he but a good spiritual guy? Or is he the Son of God? Let's pray. Lord, today we have been invited through the eyes of John to see the full context of the good news. Lord, it might not have been what we wanted to hear. But Lord, I know that this full context is so timely in the world that we live in because it speaks into a crisis of faith and a crisis of culture that we are experiencing right now. And Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you, will, that you will just drive us towards doing something with this information today. I pray, Lord, that whether there's a rejecter or a half-truth person that might be listening to my voice, that they will find a way to embrace you, the fool you, the Jesus that was part of forming this world, the Jesus that is preparing a future for us with his Father, a Jesus that is our companion here on earth to live a life that will drown out the darkness of this broken world. I pray this in your name, Jesus, Messiah, Son of God, Savior.
pray this in your name only. Amen.